All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of Limbless MD. I'm your host, Vikram Ryan. Today, I have two special guests. We have an all-star team. We got Batman Ramen. I'm not going to tell you who's who. We just got Brandon, who is part of the Brandon uh, Hall CPA. Uh, he's a certified public accountant. He's a speaker. He's founder and managing partner. And, you know, he started off in traditional life, Ernst & Young and all that. And now he's found this company that is changing uh, the, the playbook for entrepreneurs, real estate investors all over the country, finding them more tax efficiency, tax strategies, and really helping educate and empower people all over the country with this podcast. He has his partner in crime, Thomas, who's a tax strategist. He's also a real estate investor. And guys, we're going to delve into a lot of different things. We're going to talk about why doctors make mistakes in, in real estate and in taxes and investing. We're going to talk about the advantages of multifamily investing. And we're going to talk about the number one hidden strategy for physicians to improve their tax situation. What if you could reclaim hours of free time each week, create legacy building wealth, and devote more energy to your passion projects without giving up on your career as a life-saving MD? My name is Vikram Raya, functional cardiologist, high-performance coach, and real estate expert. And I'm here to give you the tools, strategies, and solutions you need to transform your life so you can unlock your limitless potential and achieve greatness all the while freeing up your precious time. Welcome to Limitless MD. Let's dive in. So let's get right into it, guys. How are you guys doing? Doing well. I, I really want to know Tom's thought on, on if he's Batman or Robin. I think, I think, you know, I think Brand, you know, Brand would have to be Batman here. I'd have to be, uh, but you yeah, know I mean, what? You look like that Christian Bale look there. So I, if, for those of you <laughs> listening to the podcast and audio, you're going to have to jump the onto Bane. the YouTube and listen to the, the Bane. Yeah. He's ready. <laughs> yeah. We're doing good, man. Thanks for, thanks for having us on. We really appreciate it. No, no, I'm excited guys. I've been pumped. Uh, so, so let's get into it, man. Um, you, you were, you were, you were doing mainstream, just like I was doing mainstream medicine, you're doing mainstream CPAing. And then you decided, Hey, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to do my own thing. Like what prompted that? Yeah. Um, I, I was a few months into my first job at PwC. I, I, I did a year and a half at PwC and then a year and a half at Ernst and Young, but I was a, just a few months into PwC and realized the corporate career track was just not for me. It's for a lot of people, but it was just not for me. And I immediately started trying to find a way out. So I found rental real estate, found bigger pockets. And I started asking questions on how can I buy my own rental real estate? Started saving up a lot of money uh, and bought my, bought a three unit property. That was my first piece of property that I ever bought. Um, and just kind of through that process, people started asking me if I was taking on clients. I, I recognized on the forums that there was a lot of tax questions. So I started answering them. And then through that process, People were just asking if I was uh, taking on clients and finally just started saying yes. And that sort of snowballed into what we have today. So we're a national accounting firm. We've got 40 or so, 41 U.S. employees and uh, like 20 offshore. So we're kind of turning into a relatively large operation. And it's been a lot of fun to to watch people, um, to, to, to build a platform where other professionals can come and grow their careers. That's awesome. And Thomas, tell me how you got uh, uh, int introduced to this gentleman here and how you got into this game. Yeah. So, you know, when I was, I went to college for accounting, uh, I always, wa always wanted to be an entrepreneur, right? That's what I always wanted to be. My parents always told me to go to college, go to college. So I went to college, become an account, became an accountant. During that time when I was in college, I realized that like, it just wouldn't get me to where I wanted to go in life probably just working the regular nine to five. So I said, you know, I started picking up the rich dad, poor dad book, started reading up on real estate. Um, ultimately went to a conference that I learned everything about real estate syndication, started investing in syndication as an LP. Um, then I had a mentor at the time that said, Hey, look, if you ever find a deal, bring it to me, we'll underwrite it. We'll syndicate it. So found a deal, went full cycle on an ATU in an apartment complex. And then there's a fork in the road. Do I go full-time in that or do I go full-time in accounting? And that's kind of met Brandon around that time. Um, and I met him on LinkedIn and I was like, Hey, you know, before I go in on this run doing whatever I was going to do, I want to see you know what you had going on seemed pretty interesting. So uh, gave me an opportunity here, and then one thing led to another, and next thing you know, here I am. So um, that's kind of how I got into this. We actually discovered what it was like multiple years into your career here. Um, it was somewhat serendipitous. You had posted on Bigger Pockets like way long time ago, and and you were like, should I get my CPA? 
And I replied and I was like, yes, you have to get your CPA. Like, here's why. Da, da, da. But it's like all right. Wasn't that what it was? Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, yeah. There's a post on bigger pockets where I was like seriously debating. I'm like, if I really just want to be a real estate investor, why am I even pursuing the CPA? It didn't make sense for me at the time, but I came that far and I posted about it on bigger pockets. And Brandon, Brandon at the time, who I didn't know, um, says, you know, oh, look, you know, I got my CPA and it's going to serve me really well. And I think that post actually probably pushed me towards finishing the CPA or was really helpful yeah. because uh, someone else had actually, uh, I think Joe Fairless might have uh, mentioned, uh, wrote something on that podcast too. And I was, I, I'm not that podcast, that that post. And I was like, all right, I got to do this. And then I ended up finishing it. So thank you. Uh, without that, that was like a year and a half before we actually that, got connected, right? Uh, yeah. That's anyway. so funny because uh, what, what if Brandon had said, oh yeah, just go, just go for real estate. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we wouldn't be here three, all three of us recording a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so, a tough so, exam. So did Joe, Joe also say get a CPA? Yeah, I think I think he said that. I think he said something along the lines of oh, like you funny. came this far, like you might as well finish out something like that. I don't yeah, remember yeah. the exact post, yeah, but yeah. it was encouraging at the time. Huh. No, I mean, think about it this way: the way like I was, I had a similar thing. Like, um, when I I was uh, I obviously went for internal medicine. I got it, uh, and I was practicing. And I was I was about to go to the next step, which is cardiology. It was super competitive, and I didn't match the first year uh, after I applied to like all these places all over the country. And I was like sort of disheartened. I was like, ah should I just go get an MBA and, and, you know, and just forget this whole thing. And then I was really like, look, uh, a cardiologist can, can do businesses, but a business guy can't do cardiology. So I was like, all right, let me just get that to get the degree. And I can always branch out later and do the thing. So similar to your thing, Thomas, where, you know, you, you get the degrees first and then you can do whatever you want with it. Right. 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 hundred percent. I love cool. that saying, by the way, that's a really good perspective. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's talk about this guys. Um, I have you on your I got a lot of horsepower of expertise here. Um, I deal with a lot of physicians. I, you know, I coach and mentor them. They invest in my company's Viking Capital. And I really want to be an advocate for these guys. They're really smart. They work super hard, but they fall short in a lot of categories, one of which is keeping the money they work so hard for. What do you think are the common mistakes or the, just the common sort of uh things like it, it's almost like they, they they have a bucket carrying a lot of water but there's a ton of holes and there's, all this stuff is leaking out i call it tax drag what is causing all this tax drag or sort of the loss of the wealth that they're working so hard for yeah well you know it it, it kind of starts off because like when you have when you have a job or when you have an active business um you your your tax your income is basically earned income and earned income is taxed up to a rate of 37 percent percent and you know physicians and other medical professionals tend to be high income earners so they get up into those high tax brackets where they're paying that 37% rate then they're also paying you know state taxes in many cases maybe local um and if they're self employed you get that extra 7.65% that for a total 15.3% in self employment tax so you have a lot of tax that people are getting taxed on and it's it's not the most efficient way necessarily to build wealth if you're looking at purely from a tax perspective. So the question becomes, okay, so you know, if you simply do that, you're always going to be at this high tax rate. But the question is, what can you do to either you know, A, reduce your taxes or B, start building an income that's more tax efficient? And that's when I think a lot of a lot of physicians, medical professionals, they start to come across real estate because real estate, you know, if you execute certain strategies, can you know help you reduce your taxes in some cases. Um, and you know, there's other strategies you can employ that can help you build more income, but without that tax drag. So, um, in other words, you're able to shelter your rental income from tax. So you'd be able to add income, reducing your effective tax rate. Um, but but you know basically earning money more tax efficiently by investing in real estate yeah and, and and if i can just add what i've seen over my career is high income earners are sometimes earning so much money that they don't know what to do with it so they just let it sit in their checking accounts and i think that that is ultimately uh well obviously hurts them um but i think that that is a big problem when it comes to any sort of tax efficiency, what you really want to be doing is, is kind of what Tom said, you want to take that money, and you want to roll it into assets that are going to produce income. And ideally, assets such as real estate that are going to produce income, effectively tax free, uh, it's nothing's ever free, right? We're kind of kicking the can down the road. And we can get into that if we really want to. But if I'm earning $600,000 as a physician, and and I'm able to go buy a handful of properties that nets me $60,000 in cash flow that I don't pay tax on, 
well, now I'm earning 660K in total income, but my taxes haven't actually changed. So my effective tax rate has been reduced. My total taxes I've paid divided by my total income. So the idea is, how do I increase my total income without increasing my total tax? And I think uh, that is the main, the main that, gap that we see with high income earners. That I want to, I want to say that again, Brandon, because that, dude, that's like a, that's like a truth bomb right Horrible. there. So, boom, it's like the net. It's not necessarily increasing income because everyone can do that. Work more hours, do whatever right, more right. things, but it's increasing income without increasing taxes. Yeah. And so that, if you, the more you can grow that delta, that's the name of the yeah. game. And then exactly. invest that difference and just compound that. And I think it's really hard to visualize, especially if you're a high income earner, because it's like, okay, if I go buy a $400,000 house that, or sorry, $300,000, let's call it 300K house that cash flows $1,000 a month, um, you know, compared to my down payments, my cash on cash return, that might actually be pretty good. But $1,000 a month, if I'm, if I'm earning six, $700,000 a year is not going to change my life. I'm not going to be excited about it. Right. Um, but the key is, is that if you, if you bought 20 of those houses um, over the span of five to 10 years, now you're netting $20,000 a month. And that is something I can be excited about, especially if I'm not paying tax today on the net $20,000 a month, right? And then, because like, if you do that math backwards, like netting, netting 200K a year, but not paying tax on it is effectively like having a W-2 job of what, $350,000? Yeah, right. It's so like one and a half times, right? The amount of yeah, you know, like, yeah. So it's a slow build, and yeah. that's where I think a lot of high income earners get antsy. And, and, and high income earners typically look at that and they go, "Well, that's not something to be excited about." This thousand dollar a month property. Um, it's again, it's very hard to visualize what the future looks like. So then the next thing they do is they go, "I want to eliminate my income today, so I don't have to pay tax today." That's what they and that's what they get all excited about. And that is where we've seen people get um uh put into situations that are going to set them up for failure later okay let's i want to explore that but uh, before we go there um i also want to talk about hey you know yes there's it's all about tax efficiency but it's also about growing the overall nest egg so those 20 homes yes they may be getting twenty thousand dollars a month but they can all appreciate in value it's a hedge against inflation i mean you're gonna your net worth is gonna explode because of all that it's honestly amazing that if you look back over the past, I mean, we, I started this firm technically in, in 2015, but I netted like 4,000 bucks. So I tell people I started in 2016. So, you know, I started this firm in like 2016. So we've been at it for what, six, seven years now. And um, we've only been in an up cycle. So every, all the real estate investors look like geniuses, but the right. ones that were doing cash out refinances all the way, I kid you not, these people added 10, $20 million to their net worth. It's insane. So yes, you don't have to do that. That's definitely a more aggressive strategy, but we have, we have seen people that have done that. And, uh, it, and so then all of a sudden the cash flow, who cares? <laughs> right. Yeah. Cause now it's just, it's just an appreciation. I'm just running the market up, but the last seven years have just been an insane explosion in growth for the real estate market. So you're exactly right. Yes. I've got the cash flow. The way that I look at it is the cash flow needs to cover the bills and give me a return that way, any appreciation it's not something I can count on, but man, if it runs up, I'm going to try to take as much advantage of that as I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Buy for cash flow, but then hold for the appreciation. Um, that's awesome, guys. Uh, let's talk about uh, physicians in general. What's what are some good strategies for physicians to one protect their income? Like, it, if there's a way for them to go from W two to either 1031 or or K one, would you guys recommend that? Going from like a W-2 to a K-1 or say like a 1099, for example. So um, I think that- Sorry, would... yeah, 10, 10, 1099, yeah. I'm thinking no, 1031 no. from real estate. <laughs> no, you know, no, where no my, worry. Where my mind, I, my mind is always, yeah. I, I knew I knew you were going with that. Uh, basically, I think it depends on what their strategy is, right? Uh, what they want to do. If Basically, when you, when you become self-employed, so you join a partnership or you start an S corporation, you receive a K-1. Um, or if you go out and you strike out on your own, um, and you work or, you know, you work for, um, different hospitals and stuff like that, you start receiving a 1099 uh, on contract. Um, you're going to be subject to self-employment tax of 15.3%. So usually when you're working and you have a W2, your employer's paying half of that amount. So 7.65% and then you're paying the other half. 
Um, so that's just something to note that when you do shift over and you do make that tra transition to self-employed, you are going to have to pay that additional tax. So um, it's not either or. It's not like what's good or better. It's like, do you want to control your own destiny? Do you want to build your own company? Do you want to go ahead and do that? Then go ahead and jump into that self-employed bucket, right? If you're comfortable, you just you know, want to go into work every day, clock in, clock out, do your job, take take the money and go build wealth, then you might, you might as well just stay W-2 because in that case, you're just not having to pay that extra tax. And when you're a high income earner, you know, that, that, that does add up. It just, it adds a little bit more to the amount you're paying. So I, I would say that it really just depends on what your goals are for your business and how you want to operate as a professional. Okay. Awesome. And then K ones um, also like, uh, is, is that more tax advantage uh, than, than the W2 or the 10, uh, 1099? I would say for the most part, like just to, just to keep it simple, I would say the K one is about just, is about the same as a 1099. Like in terms of a tax, um, like it's both active income. You're still going to be subject to self-employment tax on either the 1099 or the K one for the most okay. part. Well, let, hold on. I mean, I know that you're talking about active trader businesses, but let's let's also just recognize that it does depend on what the K-1 activity is, because if I invest in a real estate syndication or a fund, I'm going to get a K-1, but that's very tax and ad, that's very tax advantageous income at that point. Okay, so uh, to the listeners out there, we're going to make a really interesting distinction here. So when you get K ones, you can have it in an active bucket or a passive bucket, and that's what uh you know we we when when I've talked to Brandon, we've had some of these discussions. So, if I'm a owner of a practice and I own it with a couple of other doctors, and I get a K one, that's considered active. Is that correct, Brandon? Uh, if you are materially participating in that practice, yes. Okay, and then what if I'm passively in, like we own a surgical center, but we're not really I'm not active with that. Is that considered passive? If you are not materially participating in the surgical center's operations, then yes, you are, you have passive income. Right. So it's really, guys, how you define that K-1. So you want to get into this more. You want to learn the details of it. And if if it's passive, then, then technically, if you invest in something else, that can offset those passive gains if you do if you are making gains. And so this is where the, tech, the, the specificity and the technicality of the tax code is very important. It's good to have people of, of a high caliber who know this and your H and R block, uh, CPAs are not going to figure this out and, and typical, you know, run of the mill CPAs are not. And then the big box guys, they may, they may not go deep this deep with you. So yeah. explain Brandon, how like you've niched down and, and some of the people you work with also have niched down and it's how, how that's played a, a big role in the advantages. Some of these uh, entrepreneurs, physicians, real estate investors have, have taken advantage of now. Yeah, um, it, but before I do, I, I, I do want to touch on the K-1 thing. Just I want to make one more comment. Um, when you receive a K-1, let, let's say that you are invested in surgical centers and you receive a K-1, I believe that that surgical center income is going to show up in box one as ordinary income on your K-1. The mistake that we see tax professionals make is not asking clarifying questions about the activity. So what they'll do is they'll just take that K-1, that box one information that says ordinary income, and they'll code it as non-passive, basically active income. But you might have been passive in it. And that can blow up your strategy because passive income can be offset by passive losses. So if your surgical center income is passive, then your rental income or your rental losses can offset that income. Uh, without having to, you know, jump through all the hoops of the passive activity loss exceptions like real estate professional status, short term rentals, all that stuff. So it's really important to understand that sometimes tax preparers in the heat of the moment, um, they're just going to take a K one at face value, and they're going to make assumptions, but those assumptions might not necessarily be correct. So if you are, you know, if you're materially participating, let your advisors know if you're not materially participating, let your advisors know you need to be talking to your advisors about each activity, each K-1 activity and how much you actually participated. But for us niching down, I mean, um, I, I think it's been helpful. <laughs> I hope it's been helpful. Now, we, we, uh, we, we've definitely built an expertise in the real estate space. We've built an expertise around Section 469 of the Internal Revenue Code, which is the passive activity loss rules. That's where we find real estate professional status, all the short-term rental stuff that we've been talking about. Um, you know, I, I think that people come to us for our, for our expertise and it just gives them peace of mind. I mean, when I look for vendors, the thing that I don't, what I, what I look for is just to make sure that they have the competency so that I can sleep well at night. 
Um, you know, we, we, we make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. So we always try to work with our clients on that. But uh, from a technical perspective, we are, we're pretty rock solid. So that's awesome. Um, so Thomas, I know you've really delved into this and you've sort of become, you know, uh, sort of a guru on this, but tell us how like a lot of physicians all over the country are taking advantage of the fact that their W2 earners, they don't have time to get official rep status uh, in the sense that the 750 hours and all that, but there's a way that your firm has really helped a lot of physicians uh, achieve uh, some some tax efficiencies uh, from you know from the the short term rental route. Yeah, yeah. So you know, long story short, section four section four sixty nine of the tax code makes all rental activities passive by default, and what that means is that any losses that you have from that activity can only offset your passive income. So uh, what that means is you can't take those losses against your say W two income or your active business income. Um, unless you qualify as a real estate professional, which kind of like you mentioned, you need 750 hours and more than half your total working time. But there's actually a, a an exception to the definition of rental activity within Section 469, the regulations, that states if the property has an average stay of seven days or less, it's not a quote unquote rental activity. Um, and basically, you know, more or less, it becomes an, a regular trader business. And if you materially participate in that trader business, then that will become non-passive. And because it's a very capital intensive business, it's real estate, right? You're going to purchase a property and you're you're going to be able to do a cost segregation study and use bonus depreciation just like you would a long-term rental. But because if you're able to a keep that average stay seven days or less, there's another exception, 30 days or less, if you provide substantial services, which is pretty much like hotel-like services. If you're able to do that and you're able to meet one of these seven material participation tests, then effectively you're going to be able to turn your losses non-passive on your short-term rentals, which is very lucrative because you can essentially do it part-time and you can't do that with the real estate professional status. Yeah. So the key, the key is that if you can meet th this exception, um, then you, your losses can be used against your regular income. So the way that I describe it at all the events that I speak at is you have two buckets of income. You have a passive bucket and a non-passive bucket. Your rentals are automatically in the passive bucket. Your W-2 income is automatically in the non-passive bucket. And so what Tom just described is a way to get your short-term rentals into the non-passive bucket. And the key is just to understand that it's a lot easier to do, um, especially if you have a full-time job. Because if you have a full-time job and you don't, and you're buying long-term rentals, you have to qualify as a real estate professional in order to move the rentals into the non-passive bucket. And the only way you can qualify as a real estate professional is you have to spend 750 hours, but also more time in real estate than you do anywhere else. So if you have a full-time job, um, you will not be able to spend more time in real estate than your full-time job. And you might think that you can. And this is where phys this is where high-income earners get into trouble. I used to think it was just physicians. It was really just all high-income earners. This is where high-income earners get into trouble because they think that they can do it and they think that they could sell the story. But the reality is that the IRS does not care and the tax court does not care. They will never buy that you spent more time in real estate than you did at your W-2 job. So if you have a full-time W-2 job, uh, you're not gonna be able to qualify as a real estate professional, but that short-term rental strategy is a way out for you. And really when I say a way out, it's just a way to generate non-passive losses from your current investing activities. So guys, this is something that I don't think that many doctors know about, but it, it can be very beneficial. And it's something that if you have a passion and interest in, in real estate, this is a way to get started, uh, get a first short-term rental on your belt, and start helping improve your tax efficiency. Even if you even break even on the on on the short-term rental, it still makes sense because of the 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 tax benefits. Right, but uh, but I would just add in. Yeah. Sorry, just add in there real quick that short-term rental businesses can be quite lucrative from a cash flow perspective. If if done right, they can actually be a very good investment vehicle, not just not just for the tax benefits, but actually from like just the you know an investment or a business vehicle perspective. So. Um, and then I wanted to, um, you know, I've, I've had a lot of physicians come to me and talk to me about oil and gas investing. Um, I wanted to get your opinion on that, how that, that can also help offset some of the W2, um, income, uh, Brandon Thomas. I guess I'll take a moment here and just say, or I guess Tom should be doing this since you're the CFP, but, uh, you're the certified financial planner. Um, 
any investment that you undertake, you have to believe that it's going to make money, right? So we we are now very big. Uh, I don't know why I said now. We are very big on don't let the tax tail wag the dog. Like, do you want to buy short-term rentals because you believe that this market is going to be successful because you believe that you can operate a short-term rental successfully? Cool. Then let's go do it. And now we've got some tax benefits that we get to play with too. Um, same thing with long-term rentals. So if you're going to ask about oil and gas, that would be my first question is why do you want to make this investment? And if it's taxes, then I'm like, okay, well, we haven't thought through it enough to really understand if this is the right investment to make. Um, so I would say good, do more due diligence. Now, if you invest in oil and gas, yes, you can absolutely get some tax benefits. Uh, I believe it's 70 cents on the dollar you can write off, but um, right. Is that, isn't that right? Yeah, Tom? It goes it's up like to, 70 yeah, 75 to, yeah, so yeah. I've, I've yeah, seen about 70, 80 percent you know, sometimes. Yeah, in the first year they're they're doing a lot of drilling. There's like a lot of drilling costs that go into it, and there's a lot of bonus depreciation that that you can get for the for the oil and gas. But really, you know, with an oil and gas investment, uh, it has some tax benefits, but it comes with a tremendous amount of risk to get those tax benefits. And I'm not an attorney, so I can't go too deep into this. But basically, when you're when you have a working interest, the carve out under the tax code that allows you to do this without materially participating basically me, makes you a general partner. And when you become a general partner in one of these oil and gas syndicates, you're opening yourself and exposing yourself to uh, unlimited liability. So if something were to go wrong or you know you would get a capital call or something like that, you could be on the hook for a substantial amount of money. So that's something that you got to take a look at you know, from a risk management standpoint, you know, probably speak to your attorneys. Is that something that you want to take on, especially if you have a lot of other assets? Like how can you insulate yourself from that risk? And that's something I think that, a lot of people maybe don't realize about oil and gas investments in the first place. And, you know, I, I'll say something that I was recently on a, on a, on a certified, uh, basically a CPE, a continuing education. And the CPE instructor worked for a um, oil and gas company. And he goes, the primary reason why we do these investments, why people do these investments is the tax benefits. And they won't do these investments with people unless they have their CPAs buy-in. So um, it, you really have to ask your question, I guess, like like Brent said before, why do you want to do the oil and gas investments? Do you believe you can make money on the oil and gas investments? Are you okay with the risk that comes with investing in oil and gas investment? And then you just have to take those into consideration because yes, the question, the answer to the question is yes, they can save you a lot of money in taxes, but is the risk worth the reward at the end of the day? And, and the tax savings really like, I'm probably going to upset a lot of the oil and gas industry right here, but I don't think the tax benefits are even that great. Personally, when I when I look at real estate versus an oil and gas investment where I don't know where that investment's going to go, I don't know what the upside is. I don't understand the space very well. It's like, why would I, one, if there were no tax benefits, if everything was equal, why would I choose that investment? But two, when you throw the tax benefits into play, you know, the oil and gas stuff, yes, I get the write off, let's call it 70% 70, 70 of my dollar that I invest. Um, but if I invest 100k, that's a seventy thousand dollar write off in the first year. That's probably going to yield, even in the highest tax brackets, twenty five thousand dollars in savings, twenty six, twenty seven thousand dollars in savings, because it's seventy thousand. The the deduction is seventy thousand dollars, not a hundred thousand dollars. So it's my marginal tax rate, Fed potentially state times seventy thousand dollars, twenty six k or so at the highest bracket. Um, so it's really on my total investments a twenty six percent savings, which, you know, is good. But then if my investment tanks, then it wasn't worth it. Right. Yeah. Um, whereas on the flip side, real estate is typically, typically <laughs> maybe a big asterisk for maybe this year. I don't know. <laughs> a real estate investment is typically not going to tank or be fruitless. <laughs> you will have something that you can sell. So. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely based on, you know, obviously oil prices, geopolitical situations. And on top of that, I think when you invest, your principal is not returned it's given back as tax savings slash, I mean, your returns are essentially tax savings and that return on from the sale of the oil or whatever. Um, and so uh, I, I did a, a comparative analysis of the multifamily deal and the oil deal. And I think in the end, it took about eight years to two extra money. So um, interesting. It's, it's interesting. It, 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 they really get people with the, um, with the tax savings. So it's, it's just something to be, just be cognizant of, aware of, you know, as you go forward. Um, well, like you said, if you take the tax out of it, would you still right. do the deal? Right. right. That's Probably the question. Because if you, if you can't take the tax out of it and look at it like that, then what you are doing is you're letting the tax tail wag the dog. And that is going to put you into situations that is not good for you. Uh, because these marketers, like, like we've seen a, a whole blow up in, in trusts 
all of a sudden uh, over the past like probably 12 to 24 months seems like the new hot thing is to set up these spendthrift trusts because it's going to save you so much money because we do it this super cool way that nobody knows about uh and you have to sign a non-disclosure to get any information on so well, first off you have to sign a non-disclosure <laughs> that's your red flag don't do it uh but what these people are doing is they're preying on the fact that you have a current pain and it's so bad and that current pain is paying these taxes and you hate you hate seeing fifty thousand dollars in your mind go down the toilet so you're going to do anything that you can to prevent that from happening. But what ends up happening is you get into bad situations and bad investments as a result. So you got to really steal up your emotions and ask, is this right for me? I'd be curious if you've ever actually seen, um, have you analyzed multiple oil and gas deals? Like, have you actually seen one that that works? I I, I personally have not really analyzed these. Uh, you know, I have, I've had a, a, one of my... Um business partners uh he's uh he, he invests in an oil and tax deal and he goes he, he definitely got the tax write-off but he's still waiting for the actual re the returns for the deal to really got it make sense because it could be that they never actually even find oil so the entire investment's gone right or is so, there is he investing more in like a fund that diversifies the risk i think it was like somewhere like an oil rig okay. kind of thing yeah, yeah. so let, let's 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 talk about um you know uh, let's talk about your best clients so, you, you know, I think you guys have what, how, how many clients do you have total now? All over. About seven, 800. So, yeah. Like that. So, 800 clients. That's a lot of people. I'm sure some of them are really successful. Uh, and a lot of them are maybe perhaps some of them are physicians, probably a, a good percentage of physicians. But what do you see as, and when you read someone's tax return, you see their secret formula for wealth, right? You can see how successful they are. What What's a, what's a pattern? What are you seeing in the best of the best that, <laughs> my listeners on this podcast can learn from? Well, the first thing that I see is a, a bottle of bourbon shows up at my door. <laughs> 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 and in, in nice packaging. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, I think that our most successful clients, uh, I, I define success as somebody that has full control. I, I define the peak of success as somebody that is earning the amount of money that they want to earn and they have full control over their day. That's what I define as peak success. And that amount of money could be netting $10 million a year. It could be netting a hundred thousand dollars a year. Everybody has different goals, but you you're earning the net amount that you want to earn and you have full control over your day and, and full control over your day could be still going to the office and working a W2 job. It does not necessarily mean that I'm, I'm self-employed or that I'm staying at home or whatever. That's not what it means. Uh, our clients that are in that situation typically own larger assets that are easier to manage because of the economies of scale. I would say that's the number one commonality. Um, the bigger the assets, typically the more close to that peak success they're going to be. Um, and what they end up doing is as the market runs up, as it has over the past seven years, they just refinance and they buy additional very large assets. And, and when I say very large, I'm talking like, you know, five, 10, $20 million. I'm not talking about these massive, massive properties, but, um, but they're looking way bigger than your, you know, one to four unit property that's sub 500 K in your local area. Uh, you're getting professional management involved and you're collecting the checks. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I could say I was involved in a two unit apartment complex. We did that a few years ago. And once we, like, it was a lot of work getting that acquired but once you had it under contract like once you bought it like once it was acquired it was relatively smooth sailing because we had a really good property manager on that and they were able to handle everything pretty much for us so it's like really hard to find that level and that degree of a, a property manager on on single family homes uh so the large I, I would definitely have to concur with that yeah. yeah i'll tell you my experience when i you know when i first got started in real estate it was my first home was like i think twenty six thousand dollars in like a rural suburb of atlanta I was like shaking when I wrote the check and I was like, Oh, I don't know. And you know, it made, made some profit, but it was so much energy and work and we rehabbed it, you know, and then, you know, I've bought, uh, I think my biggest property we've bought so far is a 400 unit deal, you know, in, in Northern Indiana. And it was, it was so much easier. Actually, I was able to get a loan. I mean, yeah, we had to work for it and raise capital and do all that, but it's interesting that the economy is a scale. And, and, you know, they talk about this too. You want to be a billionaire, help a billion people, right? 
So if you're technically think about, you know, you, well, how many units was that, Thomas, you got into there? 82, 82 units. That's 82 families Thomas was trying to help, right? How many families are you helping? Uh, you know, a single family home, that's one family, maybe, maybe a family and a half, right? So the more people you're helping, you're, you're providing housing for or supporting, the more money you're going to make. And so, and it's easier, right? If it's all consolidated in one place, like uh, Brandon was mentioning, you got a property management company there, professional, you're playing at an institutional level. I mean, you're going to get institutional rewards. So uh, well, that's awesome. And, and I like what you just said too about the, the time, because when, when I think, when I think about scale, like economies of scale, there's the money aspect, but there's also that time aspect. Cause you're right. If I go and buy a hundred thousand dollar home, it will, I might work a little bit more to buy the million dollar property or the $10 million property. In fact, I'll probably work a lot more, but when you compare it to the total capital stack and the total return on investment, uh, it's less, right? Like, like my time is worth significantly more, even though I'm working more, it's worth significantly more to go after those larger deals. Um, a lot of that work is done on the front end. And then it's just kind of, I don't want to ever say it's coasting because that's not true. Uh, but from a, like, why, why would I go and invest all of that time into these small deals and not just do the big deals? And I say that as somebody that did invest in all these small deals, I mean, I have several properties that are just these small properties, um, and they're just, they're headaches, you know, they're just constantly, I mean, they're not, they do great, but they're just, they're just always, there's always something that pops up. You know, and it's like the worst time. It's like 10 o'clock at night when you're trying to watch a show or something with your wife and, oh man, the the water's out. And okay, well, I don't have professional management on this property because it's two units, <laughs> you know? So now I have to go deal with it. And instead, if I would just pool it all and go buy a $5 million apartment complex, I probably, sure, we might still have that problem, but I don't have to deal with it. I've got a professional management company that'll deal with it. Let me ask you a question as we wrap up here. Um, uh, there's a rise of syndications, as you've noticed, in the last five to 10 years, where more people are more aware of this type of investing. Have you seen that more in your clients? Uh, and and ha do, you, do you think that's a, it's a great way to get involved in bigger real estate without actually having to get their hands dirty? I'll, I'll say my piece. I'll be really curious to hear Thomas's piece because he's got experience directly with that. Um, so yes, we have seen an influx of syndication clients. We support syndications with tax and accounting uh, services. So we'll work with the GPs and we'll handle all the investor K ones and all that type of stuff. Um, the, there has been an influx because of how easy it was to come by money. Uh, so money needed a place to go over the past seven or so years, really past decade. But you know, if you really look at the past five to seven years, Money is super easy, really easy to raise capital. Um, everybody has money and they're trying to put money somewhere. Uh, real estate's the hot thing. So we're going to go to real estate. Um, I think that, I, I think it's great that people are uh, launching new business endeavors. I also think that, that there are going to be some syndicators that are very hurt if the market goes even flat over the next 12 to 24 months, if the market goes down, I think that there are going to be syndicators that are hurt because, you know, we see it on our end, we see all the, we see a lot of the underwriting that they do, and they're all factoring in this two to 4% annual rent growth. But if that slides off, if that goes away, um, it, then those assumptions won't align with the expectations that they provided their investors. Uh, now, you know, I, I don't know if that'll happen. Um, I've talked to a lot of syndicators about this and it's kind of like mixed opinions. Like, well, you know, we, we underwrite it, we underwrote it that way or not, but, uh, that's, I, I would, I think it's a great way for an LP to get involved. If you find somebody that's been through cycles and you find somebody that has been around for a while and they've got a consistent deliver, they've got a consistent, um, uh, uh, record of delivering returns and delivering reports, right? right? Like if somebody tells you I'm going to deliver quarterly to you and then they don't, that's a red flag. That's a problem. So I want to see you're, you're holding up your end of the bargain. You're doing what you told me you're going to do. I think it's a great way for investors to get involved. I think you got to be extra careful now because there are a lot of folks that um, I don't know are ready for a sideways market or a down market. What do you think, Tom? Right. Yeah. I mean, I would concur with a lot of what you said. Um, if you, 
I, I'm a big Warren Buffett guy. So uh, it's always, you know, management is key, um, key factor. And it's no difference. In fact, it's even more important syndication because it is a private investment. If you could find a syndication team that has a, that that's been through multiple cycles and ex has experience delivering on what they say they're going to deliver on. So they have a strong record track record of success it could be a great way to earn returns, right? Because like Brandon said, there's a lot of headaches you have to deal with single family. So in my experience, the the view, the perspective that I come from is like invest as an LP until your capital is so large that you can actually go and start acquiring these buildings yourself, or at least JVing or being a qualified purchaser, right? Um, so um yeah, I, I think in my from my perspective, it is a great way to get involved, great way to earn returns if you can invest with the right people. And then later on, if you want to look at it a larger strategy, start you can start taking down buildings yourself or start JVing with people. Um, that, that is one way to look at it. So bottom line is I'm, I'm, I'm thumbs up on, on limited partnerships, you know, in, in that strategy, as long as you, again, make sure you're investing with a management team that has the experience to do so. That's awesome guys. Um, so just a, as a reiterate guys, uh, being an LP is, it's probably advantageous if you choose conservative sponsors who've been through multi, you know, uh, as much of a, a economic cycle as possible. And I love the fact that you talked about the double R's Everyone talks about just returns, but also it's about the reporting, right? You want transparency and, and clear reporting. So guys, uh, a wealth of information you shared. Thank you so much. I think we've, we've talked about W-2s. We've talked about K-1s, 1099s. We've talked about wealth strategy for physicians. We talked about LPs and syndications. We've talked about the top f mistakes physicians can make. Uh, talking about how to get our keep our head on straight. Talking about oil and gas. A plethora of great information. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of interest in wanting people wanting to work with you, Brandon, and and your and your company. Um, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Um, if you are interested in checking out our services, you can hit us up at therealestatecpa.com. So again, that's www.therealestatecpa.com. You're also welcome to email me. My email is Brandon Hall, H A L L, at Hall C P A L L C dot com. Uh, I try to get back to everybody. My assistant also helps. So you might get one of us, but either one of those. Tom, did you want to throw anything in? Yeah, I mean, no, that's probably the best way is to get in contact. Everything that we have is pretty much on that website. So you go to the real estate you'll be able to find your way from there. Yeah. Cool. And then I think Thomas uh, has spearheaded a short term rental course. And I know a lot of my cl coaching clients have, have, have taken them up on it. So it's another, uh, you want to put in a quick plug for that? Yeah, absolutely. So if you go to courses.taxsmartinvestors.com, uh, uh, you can go ahead and register for that course. I think it's 247 right now. If you use the code Viking, actually, I believe it's $50 off if, if you use the code Viking. So uh, if you want to go check that out, um, it's helped a lot of people execute the the, you know, the short-term rental loophole, what's call, called or the strategy that we just discussed here on this podcast. So if you want to learn more, definitely please go check it out. All right, guys. Awesome. So thank you again. And thank you, listeners. Uh, keep uh, subscribing. Uh, uh, pass it on to a friend if you found this episode helpful. And guys, until next time, be phenomenal. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Limitless MD. If you found value from this episode, I encourage you to share this episode with a friend and let me know by leaving a review. For more information, make sure you check out the links in the show notes below or simply visit VikramRaya.com. So until next time, my friends, be phenomenal.